Color guard, attention. Audience, please rise. For those in uniform, please salute those not in uniform. Please place your right hand over your heart. Color guard, forward, march. Color guard, halt. Color guard, cross the colors. Color guard, close the colors. Color guard, salute. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Two. Color guard, reform. Color guard, retreat. Audience, you may be seated. I want to thank everyone for coming tonight. Tonight we have a very very special guest that probably not many of you will be able to get to see. We have specialist Ethan Moore here, the former Old Guard. Who knows what the Old Guard is? Eric. Um, he watches over like the special grades of soldiers who die in combat. Very good. Who's heard of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier? Mr. Moore was one of the guards that you would see out there pacing back and forth and guarding that tomb. Ever vigil, always there, rain, shine, snow, and sleep. You won't find more dedicated men in the military than those of the old guard. They earn a badge that is one of the rarest ones to earn in the military. Who knows what badge it is? It is the wreath badge. Second only next to the astronaut badge for the Army. And with that, I want you guys to give your utmost attention to Specialist Moore. As you guys are ever going to Arlington, I would like you to be in utter silence and respect for him as he speaks to us tonight. Specialist Moore. First, I have to say thank you for letting me come here tonight. So, and I know you guys have a lot planned, and um, I'm just honored to be a part of it. So I like questions, so I know um, your scout leader said, you know, try to keep quiet, but we're going to have fun, and I don't want to just talk <laughs> to you and at you about what I did in Arlington National Cemetery. I want to be able to talk to you about, of course, um, what we do across the country and how we can honor the fallen um, throughout our country. Sadly, a soldier was killed today um, over in Afghanistan, I believe, or maybe it was yesterday, Special Forces. So. There's um, lots of battles going on, and because of that, there's different um, gravesite, you know, cemeteries across the country. Riverside is the biggest one. Has anybody here ever gone to Riverside National Cemetery? I see a couple of hands. <coughs> have any of you, okay, this young boy scout, anybody else, you have? So is it pretty, it's kind of beautiful, right? So that's actually the busiest um, veteran cemetery in our country. There's about 40 people that get buried out there at Riverside every single day. Um, there's a lot of people that retire in California, so then old veterans are the ones who usually pass away and they get buried. Arlington National Cemetery, how many of you have heard of Arlington? A few of you, some parents have. So Arlington National Cemetery is in Virginia, over in Washington, D.C., so it's on the East Coast. Arlington was started back during the Civil War. Do you guys like history? Do you guys not like history? Some of you I like do. history? You I like know. history? Yeah. I love history. So the Civil War happened like 150 some odd years ago. Actually, it's maybe 155, 154. I can't do the math. Who's good at math? All right, how many years ago? It was 1863. Do you guys know? Oh, do you know? Uh, it was like, um, it was about 155 years. See, brilliant, you're smarter and faster than I am. So the Civil War happened way back then, and that's when Arlington started. That was America's worst um, war, even up to this date. So we had hundreds of thousands of men die. So they were looking for places to bury men. They ended up picking Arlington, Virginia. So then people were buried, soldiers were buried there throughout the time, throughout the um, coming decades. 
Has anybody heard of World War I? Do you guys know what it is? But can somebody tell me what World War I is or was? Right here. It was a war between, well, it was a world war started in 1918, but, uh, no, started in 1914 to 1918. You're brilliant, yeah. America joined it around 1918, 1917, 1918. So um, that is correct, and that's when it kind of ended, was around there. Um, so World War I was the war to end all wars, and it was against the allies, and the, um, there was the evil countries, Germany and different countries, that we then went over and we helped um, England, our allies, and France fight. Well, it was such a big war that then there were so many people killed that they didn't, weren't able to bring all the soldiers back here, the soldiers, sailors, and Marines, to America. So America is a pretty big country, the United States, so a lot of families have lost loved ones fighting um, for um, World War I. So then they felt really bad. England had made a, a Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, and then France made a Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, and then the United States, we thought we should make a Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. So this was the first time that it really happened. There was other countries in the past that had like Tomb of the Unknown Soldiers, from like the Greek era times, like thousands of years ago. But we decided we needed to have a Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. So um, Congress dedicated a place in Arlington and they actually picked an unknown from one of the battlefields in France and then ended up interring and burying that um, unknown person in Arlington National Cemetery. At first, nobody guarded it. It was just a little tabletop, kind of like a nice place to have a picnic. And that's what started to happen, actually. People would go and have picnics on top of this um, tomb, which represented all the dead from World War I. So a soldier was there, and he saw that people were just having a picnic on top of this kind of a sacred tomb, and he thought, that's not right. And he went over and said, hey, don't have a picnic here. This is the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. So shortly thereafter, he started guarding it. And he would kind of hang out there during the day when the cemetery was open, and he would say, no, no, nobody sit on it. That's a tomb right there. It's very important. And then he would talk about his experiences in World War I. Well, shortly thereafter, um, the civilians started actually guarding it. And then the army started guarding it. And eventually, the old guard, as Mark mentioned, started guarding it. So the old guard is the oldest infantry regiment in the army. So we're not the oldest soldiers obviously, because I was 21 when I guarded it. Um, the oldest infantry regiment. So George, General George Washington, who would later become? The first president. You guys are brilliant. You guys are way smarter than I was at your age. So yeah, George Washington, General George Washington, became, of course, um, President George Washington. He started the Old Guard. And the Old Guard was an infantry unit called the 3rd Infantry Regiment. They helped fight during the revolution, and they've been throughout our country's time. So because of that, they are tasked with all ceremonies in Arlington National Cemetery. Who is going to Arlington next month? You guys know? Couple of hands back there. Hand, and ma'am, you in the back, you're going to? We are going. Amazing, so uh, have you guys been before? Has anybody? Yes. No, and sir, you have? Um, the first time I went, and, and I'm kind of jumping around a little bit, trying to keep it interesting, but um, how many of you have heard of 9-11 and the terrorist attacks? Okay, so I'm from New York State, and um, I was a farm boy when that happened, and that's what kind of helped me join the Army. I decided, wow, I better join the Army. So um, I decided to join, and about October, I think it was, of 2001, which was a month after those terrorist attacks, I went and visited Arlington National Cemetery. And um, you guys are, are in for a really special time. It's kind of sombering, um, but there's hundreds of thousands of headstones. Um, and just walking through it, especially if you like history, you can see like, wow, this old section is from the Civil War. Wow, here's a section from World War I, World War II, Korea. Um, if you go to section 60, that's kind of a new section that has most of the war on terror um, casualties buried there. So in October, I went there for the first time of 2001, and when I saw the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, 
I was um, overwhelmed by the precision and kind of the love and care that the soldiers kind of gave to our fallen. And, and these are fallen because the tomb represents the big tomb. It's from World War I, which is coming up 100 years ago. You mentioned 1918. Yeah, it, was, it ended on November 11th, 19, on, at 11 o'clock. So mm -hmm. on 11 o'clock last year, it was the 100th anniversary mm -hmm. of Armistice Day. You said it. Armistice Day. You guys really do. So others, uh, you guys have heard of Armistice Day, which is also now Veterans Day. So Armistice Day, 11 o'clock, 11 on the 11th day of the 11th month, um, is when they actually signed the armistice um, between the great, the, to end the Great War. So that's when we now memorialize it. So now it's coming up. It's been 100 years. We didn't start the tomb until like 1921. So the tomb hasn't been there for 100 years yet. Just the war had ended. But um, seeing the soldiers walk back and forth and honoring them made me think, could I do that? And I asked my recruiter, could I go to the tomb of the unknown soldier? And he said, no, there's no way you could go to the tomb of the unknown soldier. So I said, that's fine. I want to be a paratrooper. So that's what I did. I joined up Infantry Airborne, which is a paratrooper. And I was um, going down to Fort Benning, Georgia. Anybody, do you guys have anybody that, has, that you've known has been in the military? You guys, a lot of you guys do. Army or what branch? Navy. 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 Yep. Marines. Marines. Army. Army. Air Force, Marines, and Navy. Air Force, Marines, and Navy. Air Force. Air Force. Anybody else? Uh, Marines. Marines. So th there's bases spread throughout the country. Um, the Army Infantry School is in Fort Benning, Georgia. So I went down to Fort Benning, Georgia, and um, it's a horrible place. Hopefully you guys can go there sometime. Um, it'll be a lot of fun. So I went there. I'd never flown. How many of you guys have even flown? Do you guys fly all the time? So Cal, you know, okay. I'd never even flown. I was a farm boy, all right? I was out shoveling manure. That's what I was doing. So um, I, I, the first time I flew, I was going off to Fort Benning, Georgia. So I flew down to Georgia, landed. It was horrible. And um, I thought, okay, this is great. Well, some guy came in to my um, bay, that's what this is called. So there's 500 of us guys in, a, in this huge bay. And a guy came in and called my number. They don't even call you by name. So um, he just called my number. Roster 425, come here. So I was all scared because that's a bad day if someone's calling your name or number in the Army. So I ran up and I saw that he had an honor guard tab on his uniform. So I perked up, I was like, you know, Sergeant, honor guard, are you from Arlington National Cemetery? And he basically told me to shut up. So I was like, oh, okay. So I was still scared, didn't know what I was doing. So then uh, they called us into a room, and then they asked us a bunch of weird questions. How many of you have ever broken the law? A couple of guys raised their hands. We said, get out. How many of you have ever filed bankruptcy? A couple of guys raised their hands. Get out. How many, and they just asked all these questions. How many of you have tattoos that can be seen on your neck? Get out. Yeah. So then they whittled us down to about 15 guys, and they said, we represent our nation's honor guard in Washington, D.C. We're the old guard of the Army. And we would wonder if you guys want to go to our Arlington National Cemetery. So I shot up my hand. I was like, Sergeant, can I go to the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier? So I doubt you have what it takes. But... If you volunteer to go to Arlington, then if you're good enough, you can volunteer to go to the tomb. And I said, well, that's good enough for me. So I volunteered. I first had to finish my infantry school, finish my parachuting school. Then I went to old, the old guard. And I was actually assigned a casket team. So first I was a casket bearer for 13 months. So I buried over 300 people in Arlington National Cemetery. Then from there, I was able to volunteer and go to the tomb of the unknown soldier. And then the real training began. So the badge that Mark mentioned is on my right breast, or left breast, depending on how you're looking at it. It's the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier Identification Badge, the wreath badge. Um, they number them as they issue them out to us. Um, it took me seven months of very intense training, um, 24 hours a day, to earn the badge, which, of course, you guys, I see, have the badges. Who's the highest-ranking person here? Right there? Are you the... 
Scouts, I don't know a lot about the Boy Scouts. Well, so like, are you the den? Well, right now my role is the assistant senior patrol leader. Assistant senior patrol leader, that's amazing. So I know you guys have to work really hard for each one of your badges, and you have to do different either tasks or you know, what's the hardest one that you've had to earn? In terms of merit badges? Yes, yes, sorry, merit uh, badges. I would have to go with um, the nuclear science merit badge. Nope, that sounds very <laughs> mental. <laughs> I couldn't have done that. That, that. that was the easiest one? I article on flying a rafting airplane. Wow. Where did you go rafting? Utah. That sounds terrifying. That's why I joined the Army, so I didn't have to go rafting. <laughs> so the Army, you get to walk on the ground or jump out of the airplane. Um, and then the nuclear science batch? Yeah. Where, where do you go for that? Do you have to go? Um, we went to a university. Okay. And it, it, was, it was pretty long. And uh, very, huh? It's salmon over? Uh, yeah. Wow. That's amazing. See, that's really intelligent. Probably that's like Air Force. You know, it tracks really, really smart guys. So the Army's really smart too, you know. But no, no we're not. Uh, just kidding. We're the smartest, the brightest, the strongest branch of the military. Um, so badges do mean something to you know each of us when we earn it, of course. And I would encourage you guys to continue to pursue your different badges and Eagle Scout and work it up. And actually, and I'm sure you guys know this. If you have made Eagle Scout and then joined the military. Um, the Army, or at least they used to, yeah, the Army gives you rank. So um, it doesn't really help because you still have to go through basic training, but you get paid more. So just trust me, it matters, it matters. So um, you'll end up getting paid more to do push-ups than the guy next to you. So that's a win right there. So um, I can drone on all day long. I'm currently in the California National Guard, just so you guys know. Um, but I got out, I was out for 10 years after the old guard, moved out here, went to college. Um, I'm now a filmmaker, that's my full-time job. And then part-time job, National Guard. Before I go back and talk more about the history of the old guard and all the ceremonies, does anybody have any questions? Because I don't want to just talk on. No questions. Well then, thank you for coming. We'll call this the next one. Okay, no questions? Okay, so the training schedule at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. It's individual based, kind of like your merit badges, probably. Like some people, you might be able to get the nuclear science, science merit badge. Is that correct? Yeah. Fast, and it might take you longer. Same with the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier identification badge. Um, the gentleman that I got pinned with, it took him 12 months to get through training. It took me seven. Um, so it's all individual based, depending on how you do it. But you have to go in to work for about 27 hours. So you'd work for 27 hours, then you have about 21 hours off, then you work for 27 hours, then you have 21 hours off, then you work for 27 hours, and then you have four days off. That's called a fireman schedule. So all the firemen, and I'm sure, who's been to the fire, local fire department? Yeah. Who likes the fire department? Only when you have a fire. That's when you like the fire department. Now they're they're awesome. I've got a bunch of friends who work on the different LA um, fire department, and um, they work they work long hours and they sleep there at the firehouse. That's the same with the tomb guards. So we'd sleep at the tomb of the unknown soldier down underneath. There's like catacombs as we called it, and it's long narrow walkways underground, and we would sleep there. And then there would always be somebody guarding. So we would be working all night long. Then at the end of the day. We'd leave at about 7 a.m. in the morning. I would go home, I'd sleep for about four hours. Then I would wake up, start working on my uniform, working on knowledge to memorize, because we'd have to memorize knowledge about Arlington National Cemetery, where famous people are buried, where the presidents are buried, where the generals are buried. Um, does anybody have any favorite general or president from the United States here? Neither do I. Yes, sir. Kennedy. Kennedy? And, yeah, I'm sure you know, President John F. Kennedy is buried in Arlington National Cemetery, and I'll talk more about that in a second. Yes? George Washington. George Washington. He is not buried in Arlington, because Arlington was not founded when he um, died. John F. Kennedy had gone and given a speech for Veterans Day um, in 18, 1963, 68, 63. I know all these facts. So, <laughs> 
Um, in, in that Veterans Day was his the time that you went there. Yeah. Um, Peter Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt. I, he's got. He's not buried at, at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, but there is an amazing um, monument nearby. It's very beautiful. But um, with John F. Kennedy, he had gone there to and he gave a speech for Veterans Day, and then he looked out over Washington D.C. and he said, "Wow, this is so beautiful. I could spend my whole life here." So then a month later, he was assassinated and killed, and um, they remembered that he had said, I, I would like to spend my whole life here. So they buried him on the hill overlooking Washington, D.C., and there's an eternal flame there that burns all the time, um, kind of to memorialize him. So we had to learn different things um, about the presidents. Another president that's buried there is um, Taft, and um, he was buried there and he's um, he's not as vis as well loved or visited as President John F. Kennedy, um, but there are two presidents and then there's a bunch of generals. Um, the highest ranking general is General John J. Black or Blackjack Pershing, as they call him, and he was the general kind of over that oversaw World War One. Kind of a neat thing. Um, generals usually have the biggest headstone possible because everybody they want the world to know that they're a general. And usually they'll put a horse over, you know, have a big statue of a horse, them on their horse, stuff like that. Well, General Pershing didn't want that. Um, he had fought with his men, and he had led his men over in Europe. So he wanted to be buried with just a little white stone. So a lot of us enlisted guys, that's our favorite um, general to visit, because he's actually buried where the most of his original men um, were buried. So it's, and he's got just the same um, stone, except it says General of the Armies, which is pretty incredible. So, um, questions? Any questions? Yes, ma'am? Uh, I grew up in Fairfax, so right, right oh, there. Oh, yeah. Um, it gets pretty hot. Have you ever had any issues with fainting or passing out? So it does get very hot. At the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, I'm proud to say there's never been fainting or um, issues. We drink a lot of water. Um, it is very, really bad, because it can get almost to 100 degrees with really hot humidity. So you're just literally drenched in your sweat, and these are wool uniforms. So um, what happens when you get dehydrated, does anybody know? You pass out, yeah. Or headaches. You get headaches, you can pass out. So. Um, to guard against dehydration, you can't necessarily start drinking when you're thirsty. You have to stay hydrated. You have to be. You have to drink days beforehand. You know, hydration takes sometimes days, so you can get dehydrated. So, unfortunately, there are stories from Arlington where people pass out um, on funeral details usually, because if it's a let's say a general being buried, um, the ceremony could actually take hours. So at that time, um, I've seen people, like, because I've done so many funerals, I've seen soldiers and different people pass out, and they'll just fall over um, completely, you know, timber. So at the tomb, um, that has never happened, and um, it won't because of the training that we go through. A, we make sure we're hydrated, and B, if a soldier was struggling, he would actually know to call his, the sergeant of the guard and say, I'm not feeling well. Somebody has to come help and take me off of the plaza, as it's called. And that's kind of something that you kind of learn as you get older is your kind of your limits. You know, when you're doing whitewater rafting, you don't want to go down a you know some water that you're not trained for. So you have to know. No, I can't do that. Yeah. Well, not without better training. Um, any other questions? Yes, sir. What's the biggest challenge you faced while guarding the tomb? Ooh, the biggest challenge I faced while guarding the tomb. So everybody that goes there, and you guys that go there, you're going to be walking for like a mile and a half just to get there. So you're not going to be, by the time you get there, you're going to be tired, you're going to be respectful, you're going to be, you know, in the right frame of mind. The average person doesn't go to the tomb to disrespect it. They understand, wow, this represents sacrifice. This represents, you know, an American who died for us. Um, some of the things, sometimes you have to remind people of that. And it's not necessarily a challenge, but um, it's kind of scary because you're kind of mentally just sitting there trying to guard and you're holding your rifle 
on your shoulder that's away from the tomb. So if this is the tomb right here, I would, and if I was standing here, you'd have your rifle in this hand. And then you walk. Does anybody know how many steps they take? 21. 21, you said it. You do heel clicks, click, turn, boom, except you're turning and facing DC. And then you count another 21 seconds, because everything's in 21. At the end of the 21 seconds, you would turn and face down the, the um, mat, it's called, and then you'd switch shoulders. And then you would have the shoulder on this side. So you're always, your bodies, it goes your wep, the odd, you know, the, the visitors, the weapons, your body, and the tomb. And then you would walk another 21 steps down the mat. So we do that, but sometimes you have to stop and turn and address the crowd and say, like, everyone will remain quiet and respectful. And it's not really a challenge, but it makes, it kind of throws you off. And it makes the, audi the audience and the visitors know, like, it's a serious place. So that was always hard to do, and I only ever had to do it, like, three times in 18 months of being there. Um, you'll see viral videos. You can look it up on YouTube and stuff. Tomb guard yells at crowd or whatever. Um, but it doesn't really happen a lot. That's challenging. The other thing that was really challenging for me was lack of sleep. So at 2 a.m. in the morning, out there walking back and forth, um, it was very hard. Sometimes, like, crying hard. So it was, it's not an easy detail. So it was very hard. And your body, you have to spend hours upon hours before your body gets used to it. So I spent four months practicing all night hours before I could finally do a daytime hour. So again, that was the hard part, is feeling the pain, feeling my own weak body getting weaker? <laughs> stronger, ah, <laughs> getting stronger. So that one says close it, right? Yes. So you're just there by yourself. Okay. You're there by yourself. So at night, you're, it's very lonely, um, very quiet. Your friends can come out and kind of um, spend time with you. And it kind of depends on how you're doing the night guarding. Um, there's different ways. If you're in training, you're in your dress uniform um, going back and forth for hours. If you're past training, it might be a more relaxed guard, um, which we don't really publicize that as much. But um, sometimes at night it's actually in camouflage. So being um, ceremonial, actually, oh, we're streaming live. Um, anyways. <laughs> Secrets out. No, it's not a secret. Um, the, with, in our documentary, you can watch, you can see uh, um, actually the guys in um, camouflage guarding at night. So with that, it's more relaxed just because the physicality of being um, in ceremonial for 24 hours straight um, really does destroy your body. Um, so it's kind of a way to change up how you do it. Yes, sir. Good question. I talked to the boys and the scouts a lot about uniform preparation. Uniform and respecting of the uniform and your uniform represents who you are as a scout. Yeah. Iron, creased, everything looking sharp. Um, and can you tell the boys about uniform prep? Yep. And what it takes? So at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, we had our these $3,000 press machines there down in the quarters. So we wouldn't just take our iron our clothes, and we wouldn't just take our clothes to the dry cleaners. We actually dry cleaned them ourselves. So at the end of each day, our shift, the first thing I would do, we'd get off at 7 a.m., the first thing I would do is take off all my medals, and I would go and I'd press out my pants and my jacket, and press it, and you have to spend probably about an hour or so pressing it out, making sure that it's correct. Then I would go home, it's now about eight, nine in the morning, I'd sleep for four hours. I mentioned that earlier. So I'd sleep for four hours, I hadn't slept for now, it was about 32 hours or so, so I would um, sleep for four hours. I would wake up about 1 p.m. This is my off day now, because you know, you're sleeping in and you're just wasting time. So I'd wake up at 1 p.m. I'd have a pounding headache. I would go to Burger King and I'd get a triple Whopper with large fries and a large drink and eat all 10,000 calories that I could find. And then I'd go back and I'd start setting up my uniform. So the first thing we'd have to do is we'd have to steam out our uniform. So we had a steamer. So I'd already pressed it. Then with the steamer, I steamed out my uniform, and then I'd put on my medals. And we have a what's called a micrometer. It's a ruler 
down to 1 64th of an inch. And we would use that to measure our uniform in all our metals to try to get them as perfect as possible. Then I would start shining my shoes. These are fake shoes that the army gives you, mm -hmm. so they're pretty shiny, I gotta admit. But at the tomb, we had actually re real leather shoes, and I we would spend, I would spend roughly about four to five hours shy, shining my shoes on my, in between days. I was not good at shining shoes, so I had to spend more time on it. And I actually failed one of my tests because of my shoes, um, because I wasn't shiny enough. So, um, did I mention I, I like to cry? So I actually cried after that, because if you fail two tests, you get thrown out and you can't continue there. So I knew I had worked all for about six months up until that point, and I knew that I had done my best, and my best wasn't good enough. So I was very shocked, because you have to retest within two weeks. So I knew that in two weeks I was gonna get tested again, and I wouldn't be able to pass. So I was very scared. Um, my sergeant pulled me aside, and he told me, Morris, you really suck at shining shoes. You know, that's when I started to cry. So I was like, yes, sir. You know, I'm trying to be a man. Yes, sir. And he was like, why don't you, what, tell me about your days. You know, how do you do it? So I told him just what I told you. You know, uniform prep. He's like, your uniform's perfect. Why do you do that first when you're awake? You should shine your shoes first because that's what you're struggling with. So that's when you've got the most energy. That's when you've got the most focus. Shine your shoes for the first five hours. And then, since you're already good with your uniform, you can set it up late at night. The infantry is not the smartest branch in the military, <laughs> but it is the best branch. So I decided, that's brilliant. So I changed how I did things, started shining my shoes in the morning, and um, I was able to improve drastically. So I like to make little jokes like that. The infantry um, really, it is the best branch in the whole military. <laughs> um, any other? Oh, back to uniform press, real quick. So we do everything. We would we would tear out the lining in our. Um, this is called a blouse, and we would actually then re-sew it ourselves. Um, we would tear out in in the pants. There's like glue that comes for the creases in, in military issue pants. We would spend hours taking out that glue with like lighter fluid, and then we would hem our pants ourselves. Um, and, or we'd help each other ham our pants. So we had literally spent months rebuilding everything on our uniforms. And then our hats we would build up and stuff. And one of the things that we learned is like you can take pride in anything. Um, so you can take pride in your scout uniform if you're out selling popcorn, if you're out, you know, it's like you want to be the kid that is in pants and, you know, t shirt. Hey, I'm in the scouts. You want to buy popcorn? You know, and people are like, you're in the scouts? Versus if you're standing there in your uniform, hey, Boy Scouts, we're raising money for my troop. You wanna buy some popcorn? People are like, oh, not really, but here you go. And then they buy popcorn, because everybody loves Boy Scout popcorn. At least I do. Yes, sir. Um, have, do you know if anybody shot on site at the tomb? That is a great question. And I do have some answers. So, unfortunately, um, Mm. So, during the Viet, how many of you have heard of Vietnam? Have any of you watched documentaries or movies about Vietnam? A couple of you guys have. What's your favorite? Do you guys have any favorite movies or documentaries about it? No. I watched a bunch of documentaries when I was a kid. My parents wouldn't let me watch the Vietnam movies, but I knew that it was pretty pretty awesome what those soldiers did. So I watched every documentary that I could find. Well, Vietnam, there's a lot of protesting going on during Vietnam. And um, there was somebody that wanted to actually um, protest the war, and they snuck into Arlington a weapon, and um, they attacked the, the tomb guards. Um, he didn't shoot um, him. He actually just went across the chains with a pistol, um, told the guy, the tomb, surprised the tomb guard, told him to put this gun down, told the tomb guard to get on his knees, and then thankfully other tomb guards came out and attacked that guy, and he went away to prison. So, um, so thank God he didn't shoot anybody, but that was the only like attack. And unfortunately, um, when I was making a documentary about the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier called The Unknowns, um, there was a tomb guard killed up in Canada, um, so at the, at the Canadian Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, and that was a tragic thing. And, 
all the tomb guards. I've got friends that are tomb guards um, in Canada as well as in um, Greece that I've been able to communicate with and talk to. So there's like, it's a very small brotherhood because it's kind of a weird thing. So um, we all were, the, the Canadian tomb guards had come down to America and had done training with us and um, some terrorists um, just executed one of their tomb guards. So, uh, but uh, thankfully at the USA, we haven't had any fatalities. Um, yeah, that's as dark as I need to get, I guess. <laughs> Moving on, no, good question though. Um, real quick, coming back to you. Yes, sir, ma'am, then back to you. Uh, um, why do you, um, so why did you carry like rifles on your back when you were in like the helicopter? Yep, so the military, and you guys did the flag ceremony, you know, to begin with. So the military has a lot of traditions, and as well as do the Boy Scouts and stuff. So the, the weapon, the rifle, has been around for drill and ceremony since it was pretty much invented. So the British had it, we, George Washington hired a general from Germany, or Prussia back then, to come over and teach our soldiers how to do drill and ceremony. Um, and then that translates to, if you're disciplined for marching, you can be disciplined on the battlefield. So there's always a rifle in, with the drill teams and with um, ceremonies in the military. So then the tomb guards carry a rifle then because of that. So, and we are actually protecting the tomb. Mm -hmm. So because of that, they then have the rifle. Um, yes, ma'am. When you have the honor of guarding the tomb as you do, and because it is grueling, I mean, it's, it's very disciplined for you. What is the time frame usually an enlisted person like yourself would take on that position you, and your rotation? Yeah, great, great question. Um, I could not do that guard duty now. I can assure you of that, unfortunately. Um, 18 months is what they usually require us to have on our contract in order to volunteer to go there. So 18 months, and they figured it would be roughly a six months to a year of training and then you would be able to do the job for six months to a year. Um, this last summer, they were understaffed. So instead of three squads or three reliefs, there was only two squads, and they just worked every 24 hours for about six months. Um, so they then tried to get more volunteers, and to help with that, actually, Congress, who sometimes works and sometimes doesn't, um, <laughs> passed a um, raise for the um, tomb guards. So there's a little um, like stipend incentive now. Oh, wasn't there when I was there. <laughs> um, yes, sir. Have any ladies joined the army and not the nurses? Wow, great question. So he asked, have any ladies joined the army and not been, been nurses? The answer is yes. So the women are in all parts of the military. The army, you guys can probably guess it, is the best branch in the military <laughs> with the most opportunities for male or female. So yeah, and the Air Force. You have to be smart to join the Air Force. <laughs> I guess this kid's gonna be in the Air Force. What's your name? Joseph? I should have asked for names, I'm sorry. Joseph? Mark? Nathan? Eden? Eden? Aiden? Sorry, man. My bad. We go? We're gonna go down, and then I'm gonna talk about women. William? Gabriel? Gabriel? Yeah, why not? Julian. Julian? Oh, what is it? Me? Yeah. Eric. Eric. Dylan. Dylan. Adrian. Max. Anybody else back there? Uh, Will. Devin. Mike. Mm -hmm. Keith. Elon. Not you guys. You're not Boy Scouts. <laughs> I see the beer. They should be. <laughs> and what about you guys in the back? You. Uh, Howie. Howie. David. Nathan. Will. And what about you, young lady? Gabrielle. Gabrielle? My first name is Ethan. I don't remember any of your names, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I tried. Okay, so can women jo join the military or the army? Yes. So recently, literally just like six months ago, they even opened up the infantry to women. Up until um, six months ago, it was only men. So women can serve in almost every capacity in the army. Um, and that includes a lot of combat zones. So like military police, because the, the wars have changed over time. So you have war from the Revolutionary War, Civil War, those are kind of like called Napoleonic warfare tactics. 
Um, th that's where people fought in, do you guys know, long lines? You ever seen those? So people are fighting in long lines, and you usually have two ranks on top of each other, one guy <laughs> behind the other guy, front row fires, the back row holds their fire, that kind of thing. So th those are called rank and files and stuff. So then we got into World War I and something called trench warfare. Yeah, you know it. So trench warfare happened because if you've got machine guns shooting 10,000 bullets down the field, who wants to stand up and say, I'll take one of those bullets? You know. So they dug down. If, if you've ever, as, as, anybody here fire guns at all? Okay, yeah. So if you'll, not that you'll ever fire guns at each other, but in the infantry, we have to do live fire exercises. You have to do training and um, with weapons and bullets flying over you. You have to fly, you know, crawl under gunfire and stuff like that, all in our training. So that when you hear bullets flying, your body moves whether you want to or not. So if bullets are going overhead, you're in the dirt, you know, and it's just like you're digging down into the dirt, you know, and you can't even stop yourself from digging down into the dirt. So you, then it takes discipline to get on from that. So women, now with the war on terror, we do what's called counterinsurgency operations. It's been called it COIN, C-O-I-N. You guys can remember that sometime. So that's called, stands for um, counterinsurgency um, something or something something operations. Anyways, um, and that doesn't spell COIN, but who knows. Um, look it up, you all have the Googles. So COIN operations is now a lot of police action. So females have been on the military police for decades, and military police have been doing missions in Iraq and Afghanistan. So women have been literally in combat for decades. Um, and then some of our allies, like Israel, has had um, women in their combat arms for generations. So then now we do too. So yes, women can serve in all branches. And wait, there's more. Women have served at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Mm -hmm. So there's been about five women that have earned the badge. It's, it is very hard. Um, I have had the honor of meeting one of the ladies. I'm Facebook friends with a couple of them. Um, a bunch of them were back in the 90s that served there. And then uh, Lady Sergeant Ruth Hanks just finished up there a little while ago. And, um, and she was just an amazing sentinel. Yes, sir? What does the infantry do? The infantry does everything. Period. Um, everybody else is there just to help the infantry. So, that's it. Um, so, I'm sorry guys, you guys will one day remember this and think, that guy was crazy. So, the infantry is going back to, and, and because we claim that we all like history, the infantry are, are the ones who actually, all joking aside, fight the wars. <laughs> I look at the camera, no, I'm sorry. So the infantry is the representation of like Roman centurions way back when, the, the Troy, the men of Troy type of thing. They're, so they're the ones that sit out in the trenches, they march 25 miles with too much weight on their backs, stuff like that. So they, they're actually the ground force. And then there's all sorts of people that help. Forward observers will say that they win wars. Whatever. Um, <laughs> forward observers are guys who volunteer. They usually parachute or whatever, and they're way out into enemy territory all by themselves. Ooh. And they'll just be like five of them. And th their job is not to get into fights. Their job is to hide and watch and listen. And then they radio back what they see. So forward observers have, I mean, everybody in the military joins to serve, and every job is very important. So, yes, sir. Didn't they remove a soldier from the tomb not too long ago because they identified him with DNA? Yes, getting back to the history of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, thanks for keeping me on point. So, and I uh, should mention, and we talked about Armistice Day and World War I. That is the main tomb that you see in the pictures. Then there's three crypts in front of them. One is for World War II, one is for Korea, and one is for the Vietnam War. Each of those crypts has an unknown soldier in it from those wars, except for Vietnam. So Vietnam um, was a very controversial war. We had 58,000 plus men who died over 10 years during that war. And a lot of the unknowns weren't really unknown. So if an airplane went down in the middle of the jungle, 
and there was five guys on board, you might not know which body part goes to who, but you knew that they were one of those five guys. It's kind of sad, and that's the realities of war. So in Vietnam, they had a helicopter crash and an airplane crash in the same area of the jungle. They knew that the unknown was one of those guys, um, but the country was kind of tearing itself apart, and there's a lot of anti-war, so Congress decided we need to show the country that we care about our dead, and we'll enter an unknown at, for the Vietnam unknown. So they kind of rushed, and they um, dedicated an unknown for Vietnam, and the, two, the families petitioned Congress, like, no, I'm pretty sure you can find out who that you know, this poor dead um, soldier, airman is. And they, in 1998, it's pretty recent, just 20 years ago, um, 19, or 21 years ago, in 1998, Congress said, you're right, we probably can figure out who that was. So they disinterred him. Then also with the new DNA abilities that we had come a long way since the 70s, they were able to easily identify, not easily, they found a piece of hair, and they were able to identify from that piece of hair um, the family. So it was First Lieutenant Michael J. Blassie was his name, and he was from Missouri, and his family wanted him sent home. So he's now buried in Jefferson Barracks National Cemetery in St. Louis, Missouri. So that's, that crypt is now empty because there basically is no unknown soldier from Vietnam. We do have unidentified soldiers, a few, um, that are over in Hawaii being, you know, kind of constantly analyzed and looked at, but it falls under the same guys as those other things. It's, okay, this guy came, this body came from this platoon, it has to be one of these guys. They haven't been able to cross-reference everybody, it's hard, it's, you know, but very, very tragic, but our government does the best that it can to identify all our fallen. Yes, sir. What's your favorite branch? Mm. Oh, my favorite branch would have to be the Marines. Uh, I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. I'm sorry. Please. I, I always go for the joke, and sometimes it's just wrong. So I do love the Army. The Army's the biggest branch, just all joking aside, because each branch does different things. So if you love the water, people will love the Navy. And I've got friends who are in the Navy for life, and they love the battleships. And if you ever go down to San Diego, Coronado Island, You've seen the Iowa? Yeah? Who has been to Iowa? That's right here in San Pedro, I think, right? San Pedro or Los Angeles? San Pedro. San Pedro? Um, the Midway. The Midway is down in San Diego. We've been. I, I've slept overnight. Yeah, really? Overnight. You guys have slept overnight? Yeah. Yeah, we're back to test to it. That's amazing. <laughs> I wish I could sleep on an aircraft carrier. No, you don't. <laughs> So I'm afraid of the water. I'm a farm kid, so I grew up milking cows and, and baling hay, so I always knew I wanted to be on the ground force. So I joined the Army, which is, fights our land-based warfare across the world. The Army has about a million men in it, or men and women, so the largest branch in the military. And because of that, it takes kind of leadership in joint service operations, usually. Um, Marines only have like 150, uh, maybe 100,000 people in it, and um, Marines do amphibious assaults. So Marines are a part of the Navy, actually, period. They'll tell you different. They'll say they're the men's department, but they're not. So I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. So <laughs> Marines, huh? Yes, Marines and Navy hate each other in, in good fun. It's all a competition. So Marines and Navy are, are brothers and sisters. So literally, and they're the part of the same branch. So the Marines are part of the Navy, and the Marines are the amphibious assault unit of our country. So they started during um, Tripoli, the Battle of Tripoli, yeah. So, and, and they, of course, are the best force in the world at doing um, amphibious assaults. So period. We um, pretty much wrote the book about it because of World War II when we did amphibious assaults, which the Army still was there for most of that, too. But anyway, <laughs> then, of course, the Air Force was invented, like in World War II, and it was the Army Air Corps originally, and then they kind of grew so big that now it's just the Air Force. Um, only a few people are pilots. The rest are mechanics. 
I'm sorry. I'm, I'm <laughs> still joking. But the Air Force is planes. So then, so if you love flying, you love the Air Force. If you love ships, you love the Navy. If you love tanks and walking, you join the Army. <laughs> <laughs> I hate both of those things, and I still love the Army. So, um, and then there was another question I think somewhere before I disintegrated down into joke yeah, land. No other questions. So yes, ma'am. Why so much training and preparation for the unknown, the soldier school? At the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier? Yeah. So, part of it is tradition. Um, and you ask why so much training. The other part is, and, and I didn't talk about it because I just kind of jumped right in. Um, when you think about all the men who died during World War I, those family members who lost an uncle, um, a grandfather, they have no body and no place to go and cry for. So that's what the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier represents, is the lost ones that our, our country has lost. And um, the family is here, maybe in California, and um, their grandfather died in World War II and never came home. They had no body. So the tomb guards want to show the families of those fallen that they're um, remembered and that they're being honored. So that is kind of part of the tradition. Um, and, and the traditions change and different things. We will do um, what's called flare with our rifle manual. And um, sometimes we're told not to. And then it goes away for a few years. And other times we're told that the heel click has to be a short little one, two versus an out and in. And it's just weird things, and we think, well, well why did that tradition change? And the, tr the real tradition is that we're honoring our nation's fallen. That's why the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier exists there. And then it exemplified itself by trying to look our nicest out there, so that a family can come. And we try to look uniform, uniform out there. That's why we wear sunglasses, not only to protect our eyes, but because it's not about the soldier that's doing the guarding, it's Literally, we don't even have rank on the uniforms. We take it off because we just want people to come and realize here's soldiers honoring our fallen. So hopefully that kind of answers and hopefully that will resonate with each of you guys. And what's interesting is, you know, if you ever get the chance, I encourage parents, on Wednesdays, I think 8 a.m. when it happens, Wednesdays, 8 a.m. in Riverside, which most of you are in school, but they'll have, um, that's the block that's set aside for burials for um, people with no family. So if you ever want to see a military funeral, um, just kind of look into that because that's a very interesting thing um, to go to a funeral and there's an old veteran with no family and you can be his family and you can be the one that is actually sitting there remembering, wow, this soldier served our country. And because um, you can do that throughout all in different ways. I should say, to honor the fallen. We can do it here in Riverside and not just over at Arlington National Cemetery. Um, yes, sir. Out of all the funerals that you participate in, which one resonates the most for you? So um, out of all the funerals that I participated in, I've got a couple of different stories. Um, as a casket bearer, you, you try to, you're right next to the family and they're crying. Um, so you try not to pay attention to that. Um, and you just try to do a good job at carrying their loved one, setting them down, laying them to rest, and then folding the flag. Um, the biggest, the most impactful ones were the active duty soldiers. Um, there are, at my age at that time, I was 21, 22, and um, I joined up to go over to Iraq, and then to be burying a soldier who was killed in Iraq was very emotional. Um, we would also, as a casket team, team member, we would fly to Dover, Delaware, and unload um, bodies coming back from Iraq. They're in little, they're little caskets. They're called transfer cases, but they have flags over them. And there's pictures. You guys have probably seen them, um, or you will see them one day. And we would go there, fly there, and unload those. And that was always very powerful. And then, um, really weird, and I wouldn't encourage this to the visitors, but um, while at the tomb, um, you work so hard. There was one time when I was out there, um, guarding, and there was one visitor that came up, and um, I, I was hurt, and I hadn't, it was in the early morning, so I'd been up for 28 hours, and um, I think, 
for whatever reason, it was a rough day. Um, and they just whispered over the railing, thanks for guarding. And I, I started to cry right there behind my sunglasses. So, um, because we don't do it for thanks at all. Um, but to realize, wow, this means something to people. Because sometimes you get tunnel vision. And you guys will get tunnel vision throughout your life. And I get tunnel vision still today. And you might think, like, I need this badge, or I need this merit badge, or I need to put in this community service. And, oh, no, this, you know, I need this Lego set, or I need to beat this video game. And, you know, Fortnite, whatever. Um, and it's like, who plays Fortnite? I don't even understand Fortnite. Like, what, what is my problem? So, is it fun? Yeah. I played it a little bit, and it, I have to admit it was fun. It was so fun that I can't play it, or else I would be addicted. So, I don't touch it. Um, no, I, I only play it, like, once. So, Fortnite. What I do like is Clash of Clans. I play that on my phone. So, yeah. What's your question? Okay. Um, so, but, but the most powerful, again, we don't do it for thanks and the tunnel vision. Sometimes I just got distracted at working on my uniform, memorizing the knowledge, honoring the fallen, that I forgot that it was actually helping people that had maybe lost loved ones. And I have a friend who had also been there at the tomb, and um, he, he had the same kind of story, but he was walking past, and a, a lady just started talking to him. And you're walking past, and she just said, my husband was killed in World War II. Thank you for doing this. He never came home. And, and you can't even stop to say, you're welcome, because you can't talk. Um, but you know it's very powerful, and you realize that's why you're there, is because so many people have missing loved ones. So. Yes, sir. Um, have you lost anybody from the army? Great question. Have I lost anybody from the army? Um, sadly, I have. Um, not me personally, um, but my good friends. So I've had a number of friends killed um, over in Iraq. And um, my sergeant from the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, Staff Sergeant Adam Dickmeyer, who actually trained me. He's the guy that taught me, hey, man, work on your shoes. Um, first, he actually was killed in um, Afghanistan, so um, in 2010, so a few years. So I got out of the Army in 2006 and came out here, went to college for filmmaking, met my wife who came with me today, Elizabeth in the back. So we got married, and then um, I just felt like we're still at war, and um, we've been at war now for coming up on, what is it, 18 years? So um, I decided I needed to go back in. So I just went back in a year ago to the California National Guard to try to become an officer. So I'm going through what's called OCS, Officer Candidate School, right now. So I'm, I'm loving it, but hopefully um, I won't ever have it to lose any soldiers. So. Could you explain the expectations of once you take the um, uniform off? Yes, so some are misnomers. To do to um, you asked about the expectations once you take the uniform off. So there is a kind of a um, an email that circulates and some viral videos that say that um, tomb guards can never swear or um, drink alcohol after they leave the army and stuff. And um, unfortunately, some tomb guards do swear. Not this guy, but some do. <laughs> So there's enough of us crazy guys that um, don't drink and don't swear that then the word spreads that we can't. Um, it is while we're there, and that's the weird thing. So it's the infantry, and the infantry is kind of um, the rough and tough guys of the military, and then you're at a place where you're working on your uniform, and you're not allowed to swear, and you're not allowed to you know, tell inappropriate jokes, things like that, because a general and might be here, you know, at the quarters, or a family who just buried their son next door, and literally it just came from a funeral, walks by and hears you talking, you know, inappropriately. So that is where those rumors have started from, and then, um, you know, not to say that we don't, because we're perfect, um, but they are a little embellished. Um, so you're still holding to an expectation. Yes, and I should say that this is the only badge in the military, and I, I should have addressed that 
that can be um, revoked even as a civilian. So all badges, and your, like your merit badges, I'm assuming once you've earned them, they're yours. Um, even if you get out of the Boy Scouts, um, they're still yours. The Tomb of the Unknown Soldier Identification Badge is the only badge in all the military that the military can take back. Um, and they do that because we do represent our nation's honor guard. So our nation then gets the final say. And that comes down to if you do anything that discredits um, the fallen, the unknowns, if you do anything illegal, um, then they will revoke your badge. So we try our best to always exemplify honor and duty, um, no matter what, even in the civilian life. My wife will, can tell you sometimes when I maybe haven't done that, but I do my best. <laughs> Any other questions? Any other? Because I could talk all night, all night, and I'm just getting started. No. Um, okay. Go for a little longer. It's fine. A little longer. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'll ask you kind of a fun question. I love it. I have a friend whose son was a Marine, and when he got done with the Corps, she said that his closet, all his clothes were like, <laughs> and all his shirts, and it drove his wife like crazy. Is that how your closet looks? <laughs> <laughs> so I have let some things go. So um, I, I have some extreme OCD tendencies, and debilitating, it's called. Who knows what OCD is? It's like obsessive compulsive disorder. So you have all your badges nicely lined up. You know, you must have a little bit of OCD in there. So I, um, I, I, dumb things like I need my hangers to go in the, you know, like I would have my clothes organized by color so that they go in a rainbow. And if I can't do that, then I don't even want to hang my clothes. So the, I've got this very weird, like either they're really organized or it's really trashy. And then I've got like piles of papers because I want to file <laughs> papers in just a certain way that I never file them. So I kind of go either way. I had a, my own steamer and I would steam my clothes and still press things out. And then I think it broke or maybe we got a smaller apartment and we got rid of it. And I was like, you know what, what am I doing? Nobody cares. Nobody's going to walk up to me and say, ooh, your shirt's not quite steamed out. I'll tell them, of course it's not steamed out. Why should it be? You know, Are you paying me to steam my clothes these days? No, you're not. So I've let some things go with organization. But I still find myself just once in a while getting hung up on the little details. And, and I, don't do this by your parents, but like threads on your uniforms, you can burn those off. Wow. And once you burn those off, or like your flags, your flags and your badges and stuff, you can like singe those just a little bit, only with adult supervision. And it makes it look a little bit crisper, you know, because then there's little threads. So we'd do that in the in um, at the tomb, and we'd burn everything only with adult supervision. <laughs> Man, look what I'm starting. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, any other questions? Yes, sir. Do you keep your uniform just in your closet, like next to any other jacket, or is there like a special spot for it? It's kind of like a mannequin standing over my bed, just kind of looking at me. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, I just, you know what, I do have it in a certain closet, and because of your question, I like the organization, so I asked my wife, can this be my uniform closet? And she said yes. So I've got a uniform closet that's only uniforms, and that makes me feel good. So I get to open the door, and I've got my stuff from the army, and then on the door, and hanging up, and I've got this organizer hanging on the door, and silly stuff like that. So yes, I do have everything hanging up on certain hangers, because at the tomb, we're given hangers with our badge and number and you know name on it, and there are these big, nicely formed hangers. So yeah, I, I do have some issues. <laughs> Next question. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Could you talk to the boys a little bit about honor and integrity and character <clears throat> and expectations of a soldier, and also how it would translate into Boy Scouts? Boy. So the Army has little things called acronyms. Probably the Boy Scouts do too. Um, acronyms. And you can use words to then help you remember things. So the Army has one called leadership. And that is the Army values. So leadership, spelled Army style, is L-D-R-S-H-I-P. 
they leave out some vowels in there. So leadership stands for loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. Every soldier, male or female, learns that in boot camp. And then they actually give out like little cards that you have that you carry with you. Those things really do try to govern everything that the military does. So if you're in on a mission in Afghanistan and you run over some guy's livelihood, maybe his goats or sheep, and you kill him, do you just drive away and just say, oh, we're at war, see ya, man? Or do you take you know, the personal courage of telling your superiors, hey, Sorry, when we were driving through, I actually killed some guy's sheep. And, and our military, because I think we're the greatest country on earth, uh, they'll send out um, teams to apologize to people like that and make restitution. How much were those sheep worth? How much were those goats worth? Here's your money. We're sorry about that. We're here to help. We're not here to hurt. Um, and that takes place even, and I mean, and it's hard, but when you're driving, I'm trying to get here on time, I want to speed. I was late because I wasn't speeding. I just got to <laughs> put that down. No, but sometimes doing what's right when nobody's looking is the hard part. Sometimes it's easy to do what's right when people are looking, when your parents are around. Hey, you know, don't do X, Y, and Z. Um, and when they're there, it's easy to obey that. When they're not there, it's sometimes easier to then um, break those rules. So at the tomb, and in Arlington, we would practice and train for hours on end, and then we would perform, and I say, I use that word loosely, but then we would do our best even when nobody's looking. So I should have mentioned one of the funerals that I had the most impact on me was one of those that I mentioned. There was no family member there. It was a World War II um, soldier. He had died, no family came to his funeral. So it was just the casket team, the bugler, and the firing party, and the chaplain. And um, that was very emotional, because we knew that we, we did our best for that soldier who was gone, and he wasn't, you know, there was nobody there to appreciate it. But we did it because it was the right thing to do. We didn't do it to be appreciated. Um, and, and kind of as you go through life, that personal, I should say the out of integrity, um, will help. And that's what's hard even as I'm going through my officer candidate program. It's hard sometimes to, um, you know, sometimes taking the, the easy road is not the right way. And sometimes you have to go the hard way. And sometimes it hurts, um, but it's worth it in the long run. Yeah. Hopefully that kind of encourages you guys. And by the way, you all can do anything, even if it's joining you. <laughs> also, it was, I suppose, tough for you to go through all that training and all the discipline that it took for you to, to finally reach that goal that you have of becoming the Sentinel. So now that you're in this program, do you think that it's helped you to be a better choice rather opposed to someone who hasn't had that position? Yes, it, it, it has, um, but it's also been very humbling. So it's humbling to be, I'm now 36 years old, and you realize, wow, I'm not in as good a shape as I was 10 years ago. And the mentally, you have to get over, and I'm still getting over those hurdles of, wow, I can do better. I know I can do better because I've done better in the past when I was on active duty. And sometimes you guys will know like, wow, you know, I aced my math test, all right. And then the next math test, you don't. And you have to kind of identify the fact like, man, I didn't study for this one. Like, that's what changed. Yeah, it was a little harder, but I could have gone to math lab. I could have asked my mom or dad for help. I could have asked my teacher and I, and I didn't. And once you I can identify for that, it helps you on. So for me, um, mentally, I feel that I've got an edge, and I'm like, yes, you know, I've, I've been there, I've been in the infantry, I've been, you know, at the old guard, and I can, you know, give something to California. And then I realize actually California's given me quite a bit. So, and that's pretty humbling. It's like, man, wow, 
Okay, so I've got a lot to learn. And a part of it, becoming an officer, is um, they kind of have to remove your brain. And they're doing that. <laughs> That's a joke. Uh, they don't really remove your brain, but officer is an enlisted. So I was, I was enlisted, I'm trying to go officer. And officer is enlisted, all this joke back and forth. So, sorry guys. Have to put up with me tonight. Any other questions? Should I talk on more? Who, who knows anything about the Civil War? Who was the president during the Civil War? Abe Lincoln. And what do you know? And Jeff Davis of the South. Um, it was like between the North and the South um, because uh, the South wanted black people still as slaves and the North wanted um, black people to be free. Correct, so Arlington was um, Robert e, General Robert E. Lee's home. And General Robert E. Lee was married to actually um, a descendant of President Washington, um, George Washington. So Robert E. Lee, his home is in Virginia, which was the South. Well, he was down farther South fighting the North. So that's why they picked Arlington to become the um, cemetery, is they kind of did it out of spite. So um, they had offered General Lee to fight for the North, and he said, no thanks, I'm gonna go fight for the South. And then um, in 1863, um, our wonderful government, in their benevolent ways, refused taxes um, from the Lee family. Um, Mrs. Lee would mail her taxes in, $13 that year, and um, she mailed her taxes in, and um, the US government said, nope, you have to hand deliver it. Well, they're in a war zone, so they denied her taxes, sent it back to her for the very reason of then confiscating the land for the cemetery. So they confiscated the land, immediately buried a bunch of dead in her rose garden just to spite her and Robert E. Lee. That is why Arlington was started, kind of out of spite and anger, but it's led to our nation's most sacred cemetery. It really is very humbling and, and very moving to go there. So I love history like that, and that's the kind of stuff actually that we learned going through the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier training. We had 17 pages of knowledge. So um, as I talk, I learn more, or I, I, under, I remember more. As um, Quartermaster J uh, Montgomery Meigs, who was buried in Arlington himself, um, he's the one that actually um, chose the, the land for the cemetery. So after the war, the Lee family um, sued our government and said um, that was wrong. You should have accepted our taxes and you shouldn't have taken our land. And the government said, you're right and they bought the land properly. And um, now it's Arlington National Cemetery. So listen to that factoid. That'll never come in handy unless you watch Jeopardy. Um, <laughs> any other questions? Or d I can delve off into even crazier history, too. So you said that in between your shifts, you have like 21 hours of a Yes. But you also said you have like five hours of just all the sort of shoes. Yep. And there's sleep and then there's so how much time do you actually get off? That is a good question. How much time do you actually get off on those in-between days? My friend, who took 12 months to get through training, had quite a bit of time off. So if you don't work on your uniform on, on that in-between day, the 21 hours, and when you go back, you get in trouble. And that's what we should talk about. Get in trouble at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. So you do a lot of push-ups. Anybody here do push-ups? <laughs> we should all do some push-ups later. Uh, so I'm not very good at them, but push-ups are one of the greatest exercises known to mankind. So I strongly encourage everybody to do like 10 push-ups a night. I don't even do 10 push-ups a night, but sometimes I do a thousand push-ups in one weekend, um, thanks to California. Anyways, um, so when we'd get in trouble, we'd have to run headstones at night. So that's kind of a fun thing and kind of insider information. So if you come back from a day off and you didn't work on your uniform because you wanted to go to Disneyland and relax, you would get in trouble. You'd do a lot of push-ups, you would have to work on your uniform there, and then at night, they would send you on headstone runs because you're supposed to know where the famous people are buried in Arlington National Cemetery. So they would say like, you need to go to General Abner Doubleday's headstone, and you would, would give you five minutes to run up to section one and grab a grave rubbing. So you'd run up there, do a grave rubbing, we'd take crayons and paper and do a grave rubbing to prove that we had been to that headstone and run back. So sometimes you would run for hours at night. 
So the next day, you make sure you worked hard on yourself. Um, for me, my time off was that lunch break when I went to Burger King for my triple Whopper. Um, that was my 45 minutes of fun and games, and that was my only off time. And because of that, you're basically working like seven, five days straight. Even on your off days, you're working. So then on your sixth day, um, I would usually sleep, literally, for 18 to 20 hours. And then I had three days off, so then I would work on my uniform some more to get it back up to speed, but then you would actually have, that would be your weekend. So you'd have more time off. Kind of a long way to answer that question, but hopefully it made it clearer than mud. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Were we to bring our scouts on a tour to Arlington National Cemetery, there are a few different other sites in the cemetery that they should not miss. Yes, so my, my favorite, of course, is, as I mentioned, General Pershing, but he's way off by himself, so you probably could miss him. President John F. Kennedy is obviously one, the Eternal Flame. I didn't really talk about that too much, but the Eternal Flame is beautiful. There's a lot of quotes, there's a wonderful area, and that's kind of on your way to the tomb. The other thing is that at um, above the hill of where President John F. Kennedy is buried is the, um, it's called the Lee House, so it's General Robert Lee's house. It's a wonderful museum. And you can go inside and there's um, park um, representatives there that you can ask questions. And there's a bunch of setups with like, this is what a bedroom would look like during the 1860s. This is what the kitchen looks like, really cool. And then there's a um, Civil War unknowns out there in the Rose Garden. Um, and like they buried 1,600 men there. So it's kind of, it's pretty sombering. And then there's an old um, memorial amphitheater, very old and rustic, because after the Civil War, the Civil War, like I said, was our, our worst um, war that we have ever even been in. So they would have ceremonies there for Memorial Day. So there's the old memorial amphitheater, and then they built the new one here, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. And the, those are kind of the highlights. The other thing is Section 60. Um, Section 60 is where all the active duty burials take place from Afghanistan and Iraq right now. So it's pretty, you know, there's guys and girls just a little bit older than you who are getting buried there. So that's pretty, pretty powerful to see that. And then one last thing near the tomb is um, Audie Murphy. He's a famous actor. Um, from um, after World War II, he's buried there, and he was the most decorated soldier. So you can, he, because he's an actor, he was a, literally a war hero, then came back and was a movie star, so you can watch him in a, a movie where he actually plays himself. So he didn't want to, because of like PTSD, anybody ever heard of that and stuff? It's like post-traumatic, yep, stress. So he didn't want to, he thought it was, he'd seen all this warfare and carnage, and he said, I don't want to play myself. You know, like, this is wrong. And then um, the director had been over there filming in World War II, um, told him, look, dude, you are the best representation of yourself. And you can show the world what it was. So that movie's called To Hell and Back. It's black and white. So you guys will hate it. You've seen parts of it? You guys are amazing. No, it's called To Hell and Back, and, and it's starring Audie Murphy, and he's buried in Arlington National Cemetery. And you should watch that movie, and then visit his headstone. And then one other thing is there's some, some fighters, fighting Joe, uh-oh, I forget his name. Um, fighting Joe Lewis, thank you. Woo! I hope we weren't on air. Oh, we are. <laughs> I am so in trouble. So, Fighting Joe Lewis um, is an African-American boxer. Um, from World War II, and he also is buried in Arlington National Cemetery near the tomb. So, um, visit him. Is there actually like a fire that burns for eternity? There is. It's called the Eternal Flame, yeah. and um, it actually runs off of oil or you know kerosene, some sort of fuel, and so that it won't go out, there are I think it's 32 um, separate ignitions going on underneath. So you could dump. 50 gallons of water right on the flame, and it would still be burning because it's constantly lighting as this flame is getting shoved upwards. So it's always going to be lit no matter what. Has there ever been graffiti there? Um, there is not. You guys have some crazy questions. You guys want to know something real? No. 
Ask me later when we're not on air about what happened there. So, no, there's never been graffiti. It's, well, it's a very honored place. And it, this isn't a bad thing. It's just an insider story that's very interesting. And you'll all want to hear it. Tune in for more. Sorry. It's got me questioning my very existence. Yes, sir. Um, when you were a sentinel there, were you um, ever witness to scouts placing the wreath there? Yes. So t especially during Cubbery or um, Jamboree. Jam yeah, Jamboree. Jamboree. Yeah. So the National Jamboree. But there would be thousands, literally thousands of Cub, uh, Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, and coming through, and they would all lay wreaths. And usually, and I don't know how you guys got selected, if, if you're going with your families or if you're going with the troop, but usually the Boy Scouts would all write like essays to try to compete to who could actually lay the wreath. This is a huge honor to actually go out onto the plaza and lay the wreath. And the tomb guards will say like, um, ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention please? The ceremony that you are about to witness is a wreath laying ceremony to be conducted for Scout 66 from Monrovia, California. Everyone will remain standing and be respectful and I just messed up the rest of that spiel. But it's a huge honor then to be the representative of your scout pack from your city or town and state and going out there to lay the wreath. So we'd see them come through all the time and anybody in, in the world um, can request to lay a wreath. So it's free, sometimes they're full. And anybody can also ring the doorbell to the tomb guards and ask for a tomb brief. So I encourage you guys to do that in, in February. So you just ring the doorbell. They'll say through the security, what is it? And you'll say, hi, we're Scout 66. Is anybody available for a tomb brief? And they'll say, go away. <laughs> be like, oh, I tried. So they will actually, um, if they have the time, they will give a brief. And they'll say, yes, somebody will come out. Oh, yeah. It's your lucky day. We have time. We'll meet you out by the flagpole, or we'll meet you up in the amphitheater, and we'll send a tomb guard out when he's done walking. We're going to go do the guard change. And we'll take care of you. If they're too busy, they'll say, "I'm sorry, man. You know, sir, ma'am, we're too busy today. Um, I apologize." But it is our duty to serve as like the face of the army to um, America. So, I'm sure, you do that. Yes, ma'am. I have to tell you that Carol's daughter, my granddaughter. We're honored to place the wreath on the tomb of the unknown soldier. No way! For See, this, we're just school. we're just talking. What for? For the school? For the school. What school was it? Arcadia Christian. Arcadia Christian. It's awesome to know. Thank you guys. You know, and there's a perfect example. Then you know, it really is. Will be a special time. Are you guys slaying a wreath? The ones who are going. Do you guys we know? Hoped. You are. Yeah, we hope. We hoped. Yeah, that's awesome. We have to audition. Okay. So who's is it? Your oh, so it's Arcadia it's Christian school, going back. Yeah, I see. The younger brothers of our I brothers. see. Ooh. So usually, sometimes they'll even have tomb guards. They'll mail them in and please bring your essays. You know, like you can do that. Ring the doorbell. Hey. So we would read them. I mean, we're there for 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and you know, there's yeah. Anyways. So kids would bring in, hi, I wrote this essay um, about the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, or what the military means to me, or what freedom means to me. They all have different things. And we would, we'd just set them on the table, and then the soldiers, as throughout the night, we would just leaf through them. And then we actually collect them. So I have a bunch of things that um, I collected while there. So different, um, one was a Christian school that all the kids had signed a scroll, and the scroll was then on the wreath. So every morning, all the wreaths get thrown away. Um, so it's kind of sad, so we would actually take mementos off of it. So I have the scroll, and it's just got all these little kids' handwriting on it saying, thank you for your service. And then I have another one from um, the Gold Star Mothers. Um, those are the moms who have lost um, children in war. So they laid a wreath that I was um, helped them lay. So then the next morning, I took the yellow ribbon off of it, um, the gold ribbon. So, little mementos like that. So if you bring your essays, you can just ring the doorbell, hey, we wanna give you these essays. Worst they're gonna do is say, ha ah, ha we threw the last ones in the trash. They would never say that, I'm only joking. <laughs> um, so, sorry, I'm only joking. <laughs> they would, we, uh, we would love that. Yes, sir. Your hand's not up. 
<laughs> <Of course>. <laughs> <laughs> Neither was mine. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, kids, that you had to sift through this, but I'm glad and honored that I was here to do it. Um, talk to you guys. Any other questions? And I'm not going to rush out, so I'll be here to answer and talk about anything else. Yep, I'm here all night. So you said that when a body is identified, they have to put in a new one for an unidentified soldier. Wouldn't there be others that they didn't know who they were? What would you do with those bodies while there's already one of those? Yep. Um, so a lot of the unknown bodies from World War II, World War I, and Korea are still buried overseas. So, and they're in graves. There's unknown bodies in Arlington. So they just found, and this is really cool, we talked about the Civil War, there was a construction project about six months ago in Virginia, and I think they were laying either new electric lines or um, new gas lines, I'm not sure. And they found two Civil War skeletal remains. And so they have to stop, as soon as you find human bones, you have to stop all production, you know, construction. So they excavated, and it was near this big, huge tree that they were taking down as well, that had grown up over these two dead guys. The tree was like 150 years old. So they found um, one of the guys, and it's very interesting what our um, forensic scientists can figure out. So one of the guys was shot in the back, and they could tell that he was running um, away, obviously, from combat or the enemy. Who knows? Um, and they don't know if it was an enemy that died with him or maybe his friend. Because the other guy was kind of heading towards him. Um, so they think, they, they figured, that the other guy went back to try to grab him. So how they could tell that is how the bones were compressed. They could tell that the guy was running and was in mid-step when he was shot. So they could tell that because of how the bones were kind of crunched together and then the way that it was shattered by the bullet. So he, he died, someone else then died right there with him, and they were buddies. Arlington was getting ready to open up a new section. So they decided to call it the Millennium Section, and they just opened it a couple months ago, and they buried those two guys, those are Civil War unknowns, they buried them together in caskets made from that tree. So they actually made caskets. I talked to the casket bearers, and the caskets were really heavy. So <laughs> caskets are, can vary in, in weight from 100 pounds to 1,000 pounds. So being made from the tree is really heavy. So I say all that, there are unknowns buried around the world. Vietnam, we don't have any unknowns, thank God. That, and that's why, so when they took out that unknown from Vietnam, the only unknowns from Vietnam are over in Hawaii. Um, and they kind of know who they might be, so we don't have any. So that's why that one's empty. That was a long answer to that, but I thought that was a cool story when I heard about it with the um, Millennium Edition of the cemetery. Great question. Any other questions? Everybody done listening to me talk? <laughs> no, no. I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty too. Try talking as long as I talk. So thank you guys for coming. Thanks, parents, for coming. Um, like I said, I'll be here to answer any questions. We've got some time. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Oh. I appreciate it. <laughs> Will, can you close this out? with all the scouts and specialist Morris, if you know if that's okay. Should we do it in the corner and take the flag over there? Scouts, can you guys take the flags and um, move that American flag over there a little bit?
Thank you. 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 Thank you.